chapter 4. God created everything for his pleasure. And, you know, it doesn't take a very bright individual to know if you're not giving him some pleasure by, well, how do you pleasure? Let him know you love him. That's what he wants most from you, Hosea 6.6. 6. He wants your love more than, any, than your burnt offerings, your sacrifices, all of it. He wants your love. That's why he created you. And how does love originate? Can anybody explain it? It originates from within you. You can't order it, you can't buy it, you can't force it. You either love him or you don't. You either please him or you don't. So love is the most powerful force in the world. And that's what he wants from you and that really, really pleases him. Do you know something? He loved you enough that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe upon him would just simply accept him, love him, would never die, would not perish, but have eternal life. So that's how much he loved you. And that's because, in a sense, Emmanuel, God with us, he did that for us. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Isaiah chapter 62. As we get into this uh, lecture, this sermon on Father's good pleasure. I'm going to start by giving some of his promises, and we'll take it from there. Isaiah chapter 62, verse 1. For Zion's sake will I not hold my peace, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest until the righteousness thereof go forth as brightness, and the salvation thereof as a lamp that burneth. Our Father, you know, He's driven to save His people and he, His children. And He chooses people like yourself that love Him, that can plant seeds and let His children see that it is salvation in the eternal life that He wants for all of His children. He doesn't get up and look for someone to zap every morning. Why? They're his children. He loves them. He may not love what we do sometimes, but he does love his children. All right. Uh, verse 2. And the Gentiles, translate it nations, okay? The nation shall see the righteousness. They'll see what is done right and what is wrong. Um, and all kings thy glory, and thou shalt be called by a new name. This is those that love him, which the mouth of the Lord shall name. He's going to give you that name. Verse 3, thou shalt also be a crown of glory in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of thy God. Now you talk about pleasing him. He's documenting there that he is pleased in you. Well, does that make us royalty? Well, not in the sense of being better than anyone else or anything, but just simply the royal diadem of true love, that you love your Father, that you want to be with him. You want him to be with you. You want him to be in your family. You want him to be the centerpiece of your dinner table. You want him there. And you want him in your life. And do you know something? That pleases him. That pleases him. That's why he wrote you this letter. Because it declares his love for you. And, do you, and like I, you've heard me say over and over, he doesn't have anyone else like you. You are unique. You're different than anyone else. Aren't you glad? <laughs> but, but, but you are, and, uh, and that's why he created you, and he wants you for the eternity. But there are other options, okay? Make sure you don't take one of those. But, but he looks at you as though he could be so proud of you that you would be a part of that crown. What kind of crown? Verse 4. It's a bridal crown, of course. That's what he's talking about because he's looking forward to a spiritual wedding. Verse 4 reading, Thou shalt no more be termed forsaken, 
Neither shalt thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, Hes and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. And, and of course, uh, Hezbollah being my delight is in her, my pleasure is in her, I am pleased with her. She makes God happy, okay? That's given in the feminine sense for all people that love our Father. And of course, Beulah, what does Beulah mean? It means married. And the wedding's already taken place, got it? Spiritually speaking, now you understand because it had, there's no gender in this. And in a sense, uh, you're joined with him, and that is the new name, the bride, okay? The, the bride of Almighty God, but really what it really is saying, you're part of the family, the family of God, God's children. And God loves his children very much. He, he has proved that over and over. Mainly, he proved it on the cross, and no one can doubt that. Uh, verse 5, For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. Rejoicing meaneth he's delighted. He's delighted in you. It isn't difficult to please your father. All you have to do is love him. Let him know that you love him. Let him know that you want to serve him. That, that doesn't mean you have to do anything but just be pleasant in the conversation of our Father's Word, a smile, a helping hand to someone when they are really down sometime. And you, you know, just, just to lift them up a little bit with the Word of God your word if you be a child of God. Why? You carry his name. Well, how do I carry God's name? Well, you're a Christian, aren't you? What, is, what does Christian mean? It means Christ man. You're carrying his name. And you might go a step further and say, well, what does his name mean, Christ? It means anointed. Anointed with all of our people. Anointed into the love of the family. All right. Uh, verse 6. I have set watchmen upon the wall, thy walls, O Jerusalem. Don't think they're not there today, my friend. Don't think they're not everywhere today, the watchmen that watch out for Almighty God. Have you never read it in the great book of Matthew where your angel has the face of God at any time God's elect get in trouble? You know, they're there, okay? And don't make a religion out of that. That's just a fact, okay? That's your Father's love. O Jerusalem, which shall never hold thy peace, day nor night, yet ye that make mention of the Lord, keep not silent. That means God's elect. Don't keep silent. What does that mean? Well, don't, don't be bashful about asking God to bring peace. Don't be bashful about asking God to bless your family, your business, your, your life. Hey, prayer is what? It's talking to Him, communicating. Do you know what? God doesn't like some written out long religious prayer. You, that's not from your heart. That's somebody else wrote that stuff. He just wants good old country right down to where the rubber meets the road. Talk to me. Tell me what is in your heart. Don't play games with me. Be honest and straightforward and I will hear you. That's the way he operates, friend. Why? That's love. Because he loves you. And he calls that communicating when you're talking from the heart. Instead of somebody to reach over and, you know, sometimes I do. I'm called on to, and I'm not knocking preachers here, okay? I, I'm really not, but, but it kind of just is a turn off to me when I'm asked to do a joint uh, service, funeral service, you know, with another person of a religion, and their preacher gets up and pulls out this long scroll when it's time for him to pray. Oh, Heavenly Father. And he reads this thing, 
and it's just a turn off to me. I don't, I just really feel, I feel like we're kind of mocking God's intelligence. You know, why not talk about the dear loved one we're, we're parting with and how we miss them and how we know they were already with the Father and we thank Him for having shared him, them with us. Not some, something that somebody wrote in 1575, you know, or sometime. Anyway, that's just a little pet peeve of mine, and maybe that's, maybe that's my uh, shortcoming to not have patience with that preacher to sit there and smile and say, wasn't that wonderful? You know, uh, I don't do business that way. But anyway, um, I'm going to sidetrack myself to where I don't even know where we are for sure because, but anyway, Delight your father. Be pleasing to him. Don't play games with him. Boy, if you want to get in trouble, just try to put on an act. I'm going to get up and I'm going to be good all day because I want to say a word to God. Hey, talk to him every day. He, he knows whether you've been good or bad. And, and you better repent. Just simply repent for that that is bad before you talk to him and you're in good standing anyway if you're honest in it. Okay, right down where the rubber meets the road, talk to him. And when you mess up, say, Father, guess what? It's me again. All over, I blew it. I don't know how come. It seems like I talked to you about it and it happens again. Anyway, let him know that... Um, that I know you all are not really bad sinners, okay, that you do this over and over, but you know where I'm coming from. Be pleasing to him. Talk to him. Do you know that most marriages fall apart because of, this is the truth, because of lack of communication? Two people won't talk. They're good people. And they really love each other. And the dummies won't talk. They won't tell each other, baby, I love you. Big boy, you're sweet. You know? Man, that'd do it, you know. That'll straighten stuff. That'd take care of a whole bunch of troubles. But they won't communicate. And that's where trouble gets started. So remember that in pleasing your father, communicate. And that's, that's mean being yourself, talk to him, and be pleasing to him so that those blessings flow from him to you, okay? And I think I'm at verse 7. And give him no rest. Don't, don't stop and say, well, God's busy today. Give him no rest or silence till he establish and until he make Jerusalem a praise in the earth. And again, it's certainly not now. We've got trouble all around it. And, um, and some terrible things that are taking place there are people blowing themselves up. That's, that's not godly. That isn't what God created man for, is to blow each other up. And, of course, this has nothing to do with man protecting the nation either. But I think you know where I'm coming from. That's a different subject, and I ain't going there today. Verse 38, chapter 38 in Isaiah. Let's go there instead. What is pleasing to God? I want to kind of fix the setting here. Old Hezekiah, he hadn't done right by any means, and he's, he's died. I mean, uh, he's going to be deader than a hammer. And finally, he straightens himself out, and he starts telling God how much he loves him. And all Isaiah told him, well, if you'll just take a bunch of figs and make you a, uh, what do you call it, a, a polis and put right on there, it'll draw all that poison out, and you'll live. Well, he did it. But Hezekiah wanted a sign from God, and do you know what God did? He set the sun back 10 degrees. I believe that. I truly do. And that's what we're coming into right here, is how much God loves his people and what he will do for them. Isaiah chapter 38, let's pick it up with verse uh, 15 as he's speaking, all right? 15, what, what shall I say? Question. Uh, this is Isaiah chapter 38, verse 15. What, what shall I say? He hath both spoken unto me, and himself hath done it. I shall go softly all my years, 
in the bitterness of my soul. Um, <laughs> remembers deception. Don't, don't get wrapped up in deception. Um, and your soul, if you love God, your soul shouldn't be bitter. He'll fix it, okay? Verse 16, Lord, by these things men live, and in all these things is the life of my spirit. So wilt thou recover me and make me to live. You will give me eternal life. Here I, here I thought I was dead. I'd given up almost. And here you've revived me. Why? God loves his children. And he used this man to help his children, all right? And 17. Behold, for peace, I have great bitterness. But thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind my back. Now, whenever you get to thinking that you're down and when you get to thinking your sins have just got you bottomed out, I want you to remember the word love as it is used in this verse, in the Hebrew tongue, it means it, it means, this love means uh, um, loving to be with you, loving to be near you, uh, love because you give pleasure to him. All right. It means all this one little word, love, it's a little different than love is translated in some places. And, um, and it's real special. He delights. It means if you love someone, you delight in them. That's, that's just, that's true love. You can't help delighting in it and wanting to be near that person and, and enjoying, enjoying and delighting in that love one for the other. So this is a special love. God just reached down and gave him life. Why? He deserved it. He asked for it. He got it. So don't be a sad sack. A lot of people look at bitterness and say, oh, the bitterness has brought me down. Well, hang in there with it, and it'll sure do it. You know, sometimes I think people just like to have a little bitter thing happen to them, and then they'll remember it for six months, and that's all they can talk about. You know, no, it's more it's me. Huh? You betcha. And that's why nobody wants to be around you. So, how are you doing today? Have you got an hour? <laughs> and everybody runs the other way when they see that dude coming, you know. So, uh, and kind of the song, Smile, and the whole world smiles with you, okay. Uh, God will fix it. You don't have to put up with that kind of stuff. You have power over all your enemies. Take care of business. Get it out of your life. I mean, literally, you know, used to when I had time to counsel people, I'd say, if you can't do it any other way, go to the back door of your house. You start a cemetery, and every time you get a negative thought, you put it over your shoulder and bury it. And then get about your business thinking positive, whereby you can accomplish something. Oh, woe is me. Now, not, not, not when you've got your father. Don't you understand you're a child of the living God that created all things and he loves you from his heart. He doesn't play games with you. Friend, he wants you to be in that wedding. He wants to give you a new name, Mary Beulah, joined with him. And, and, uh, and he means business with it, okay? So that word love is just a, it's a little four-letter word there that is so packed and powerful to delight in. And he does in you. Verse 18, for the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee. I mean, death, where is your sting? It ain't going to happen. We're children of the living, okay? They that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth. Your, the truth sets you free from the pit, meaning Satan's lies, his deception. Hey, you don't have to put up with it. Don't. I mean, absolutely, if you in your life give Satan one second, you gave him too much. Put him out of your life. You have power over him. 19, the living, the living. That's two times for emphasis. He says, get with me. 
the, you're living. You're not the dead. Why? If we're talking eternal life here. You're my children. You're my bride. He shall praise thee as I do this day. The father to the children shall make known thy truth. And his truth will set you free from the hang-ups of woe is me. Woe is everything. The Lord was ready to save me. Therefore, we will sing my songs to the stringed instruments all the days of our life in the house of the Lord. How precious it is to have that love and to have that feeling toward him and to have him touch you and bring you up into that love, into that family, to become a part to have that new name joined with Almighty God. For Isaiah had said, let them take a lump of figs and lay it for a plaster upon the boil, and he, will, he shall recover. Boy, they put that pack of figs on there, and that old boil popped out of there, ping! And I mean, he said, I feel better already. He was doing good, all right? God can simplify things if you will let him. Hezekiah also had said, what is the sign that I shall go up to the house of the Lord? Beloved, God gave him a special one because he expected much from him. He turned the sun back 10 degrees. And there's a lot in that. It's a different subject for a whole different time. But he gives you a sign also. And you see it every time you see, you're reminded of it every time you see the cross. That documents his love for you. That he cared enough for you that he wanted to give, he, hey, we, can't, we couldn't make it without him. We fall short. I don't know if any of you have noticed it. We're just not perfect. You know, we kind of fall a little short every once in a while. But he paid that price so that on repentance, you can stand up there and say, I'm forgiven. Not perfect, but I'm forgiven. And that makes me clean. And thank you, Father, and I love you for it. And he will return that love. It makes his day. Okay. So uh, there we see what that in that love, that is a delight. And it pleases God so to love you. Go with me to 42 in this same book, Isaiah 42. to get here to documenting that he loved us for he sent us someone okay 42 verse 1 behold my servant whom I uphold mine elect in whom my soul delighteth I mean it pleases me it makes my day Do you understand this is the father speaking I have put my spirit upon him. He shall bring forth judgment to the nations, to the Gentiles, meaning nations. Judgment means that that is just. You know, we've got a lot of things in this world today that are not just. That's, that's going to all be straightened out. And do you know who it's straightened out by? Well, what man is going to do that? Ain't no man. Is, there is not a man that is going to do that, okay? Christ is going to do that. Why? He knows what's in a person's heart, in your mind. Therefore, he has the right to judge because you can't con him. He's got you, friend. But then there comes you, the elect, along with that. That when he judges, he says, my, my, look what all they've got coming right here. It's in the book of life. They've got a, a, a brand new flying vehicle. They've got a big mansion over here. They got it all. My, I can judge them nicely. So for, for God's elect, for those that love him and that give him pleasure, judgment is fantastic. If you think you've got it nice here on earth, just wait until we have it back on earth again in the spiritual body in the third earth age. Man, it's going to be something. And, and, uh, and you're going to be something. You already are something. 
if you love him, if you give him pleasure. He's talking here primarily about his son and the election that are connected with and joined with him and have been joined with him ever since the first earth age at the overthrow of Satan. Okay? This is why he would say, uh, I chose you before the foundations of the earth. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 4. Okay? Verse 2. He shall not cry, nor lift up, nor cause his voice to be heard in the street. He's, he's going to be stern, but he's going to be gentle. He's going to take care of business. He's not going to make a big loud noise. Think, think of Christ preaching in the street, okay? Think of his parables. Three, a bruised reed shall he not break, and the smoking flax shall he not quince. He shall bring forth judgment, that's to make things right, unto truth. Uh, justice to the wrong. He's going to take care of business. Do you know, have you ever, have you ever seen um, uh, smoking flax? Do you know what that is? That's a wick that is so burned back that it's just, it's already smoking. You don't have a clear light there. It's not trimmed, okay? And it's smoking and it's just about probably to get back down into the wax and go out. And it's saying he is so gentle that he can take the scissors and reach down and trim that wick without putting out the fire, the light. So when you're down and your old light is getting pretty dim as far as reaching people, if you love him and talk to him, he can with gentleness reach down and trim your wick without ever putting the fire in your heart out to where you brighten up and you become a bright light reflecting his truth because he's the true light. And um, uh, do you know uh, a bruised reed? Have you, ever, have you ever walked through reeds and had one that's kind of bruised? And I mean, if you, if you shake it, it'll break real easy. And he's so gentle when he works. And he's gentle when he works with you. Now, if you be one of God's elect, and he has, you might remember old uh, Jonah that we just got through teaching in um, Minor Prophets, Jonah was chosen by God to go teach the Ninevites. Now, he didn't use this gentle stuff on Jonah. He said, Jonah, you listen to me, boy. <laughs> I mean, he, he, he let Jonah, because he disobeyed, have some pretty rough times. But whose fault was it? It was Jonah's. Can we fault Jonah? No, he wanted to save his people. So it's just one of those things where uh, the moral of the story, of course, is God knows better than we do. If God says it, that pretty well is the way it is, friend, and there's no shortcuts to his word. But when he's working with you, he is so gentle when he touches you and guides you. And he'll never put your light out. That, that means you're shining forth where you're a blessing to people. And, and, and what, does, what does a light do? It reflects light in a sense. It, 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 it dissipates darkness and brings in light into people's lives whereby they can see that God loves them. The living, the living. How God loves uh, his living and how he loves to give light and how gentle he is. Verse 4, he shall not fail nor be discouraged till he have set, till he have set judgment in the earth and the isles shall wait for his law. They shall want his law probably would be better translated. Why? His, his law is fair. His law says, do, do right to your neighbor, and your neighbor will do right to you. And do you know something? I found that to be true all my life. If I treat my neighbors nice, they usually treat me nice in return if they're worth a flip. 
Okay? And if they're not, well, just mark that man anyway. But usually they're going to be sweet to you if you're sweet to them. I happen to have the best neighbors in the world. I love them. I really do. Um, and uh, they're a big help to me, and I trust I'm a big help to them. But they're more of a help to me than I am them. But, but uh, and, and, I, and I love them for that. Anyway, uh, treat people right, okay? And they'll treat you right. Wouldn't it be nice if we were all perfect and everybody was treated right all the time? It doesn't work that way. I'm sorry, we're not perfect. Verse 5, Thus saith God the Lord, He that created the heavens and stretched them out. That's the power. He that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it. He that giveth breath unto the people upon it. And spirit, that's to say soul, intellect, to them that walk therein. Um, that's the Messiah. He does that. You know, I, what I want you to see here in love, what you're connected into. God that created all things. And some of you might wonder what I'll take to lunch today. Wonder if I'll even have a lunch. Well, you're a child of the living God and he owns everything. Talk to him about it, you know. And uh, maybe if, if things are too bad, go, go borrow a sandwich from your neighbor. <laughs> I don't recommend that. You should, you should think far enough ahead to have your own sandwich. What, what, what my point being, don't worry. When you're a child of God that owns everything and created everything, why should you worry? Talk about wasting time. Talk about doubting God's promises is a worry wart. Okay? You, you, the biggest waste of time in the world is a worry wart. Okay? Because God will always take care of you. Verse 6, I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand. Now understand, well, did it say, I the Lord who have called you when you're a big mess up doing crooked things all the time? That isn't what it said. It said, I the Lord have called thee in righteousness when doing stuff right and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the nations or the Gentiles. Naturally, that is Christ. Uh, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. And of course, you know he actually did this. When he died on the cross while he was yet in the tomb, as it is written in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 and 19, he went all the way back to everyone that had died all the way to the time of Noah, meaning from the beginning, and gave them the same opportunity to receive salvation that you have today. He did. And do you know something? Chapter 4 of 1 Peter says a lot of them took him up on it. And he freed them. The same as you're free when you uh, operate in that love. I am, verse 8, I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory, that word Yahweh. And my glory will I not give to another, neither my praise to graven images. You, there's only one word of God, and that living word is Christ himself. He kept his promise. He sent him, and he made it possible for us to have everything forgiven that we need forgiven when we even halfway try. Why? He loves you. And it delights him when you love him, when you return that love. Behold, the former things are come to pass, and new things do I declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. That's why the prophecies are so important to you. They shouldn't be too many surprises for you when you're familiar with the word. What he said is, I'm going to tell you the future. Where did he tell us? In the prophets. We know the false Christ is coming first. We know there are a lot of things, and we know just how they're going down, so there's no surprises. Do you know what man fears? Man fears what he doesn't know, or the unknown. When man knows what's coming at him, I don't care if it's a locomotive. 
pretty soon he prays about it and he says, well, if a locomotive is coming, all I got to do is get off the track. <laughs> and you got it made. <laughs> you don't fear what you uh, know. You can handle it. You go through it, around it, under it, or, or over it. You'll handle it, okay? So God, through the prophets, lets you know. So take care of business, all right? And, um, okay, for, did we get to verse 9? That's where I was supposed to quit, and that was it. Okay, so let's go to the New Testament for a moment. Let's go to Matthew chapter 12. I want, I want to show you that God is the same yesterday He is today, and He doesn't forget what He promises, like some people will do. They will. But God doesn't forget His promises. Matthew chapter 12, New Testament, we'll pick it up here in verse 14. Uh, what has happened, um, uh, Jesus just healed a man on the Sabbath, okay, had a wilted hand, and it upset some people. And Jesus answered just prior to where we're going to pick up here, he said, hey, if you got a, a sheep that's um, in a pit or something, or if he falls into a pit on the Sabbath, do you not lay hold on it and drag it out? Well, of course. He'll ground if I don't. Okay. Well, he says, then why can I help these people? They're, they're my children, okay? Which is, which is common sense, okay? A lot of people make a religion out of a day, and that's where Jesus is coming from. So we pick it up immediately following that. What delights God? Okay, verse chapter 12. The thought I want to instill in your mind, though, we've been reading from the Old Testament. God's Word is the same yesterday, it is today, and it will be forever. He doesn't change. That's why you can count on Him, okay? So verse 14 of chapter 12, the great book of Matthew. Then the Pharisees went out and held a council against Him how they might destroy Him. And a nice bunch of people. I mean, He heals a man and they want to kill Him. That, that doesn't make sense, does it? Well, <clears throat> 15. But when Jesus knew it, he withdrew himself from thence, and great multitudes followed him, and he healed them all. Now, you talk about uh, interfering with the uh, boys downtown's religion. That'd get it done, okay? Just, I mean, lay hands on them and heal them. 16, I mean, they, they draw money for that, see? And then it don't work. Okay, 16, and charged them that they should not make him known. It wasn't quite time, okay? 17, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah, which is Isaiah. This is the Greek spelling. The Hebrew spelling is Isaiah. The prophet saying, and you'll recognize it, this is where we were in Isaiah 42, 1, okay? Behold my servant, whom I have chosen, my beloved, in whom my soul is well pleased. I, he makes me happy. I'm pleased with him. I will put my spirit upon him, that's the Holy Spirit, and he shall show judgment to the Gentiles, to the nations. He's going to see that things work out fair. He shall not strive. That, that means he, he's not going to argue with you. He's the living word, and he's not going to argue about it, nor cry. He's, he's not going to make some big clamor. Neither shall any man hear his voice in the streets. He uses gentle persuasion, gentle love, through that gentle persuasion. In other words, this hasn't changed from the Old Testament. We just read it, right? Okay. Um, 20, a, bree, a bruised reed shall not, uh, he, shall he not break, and smoking flax shall he not quench, till he send forth judgment unto victory. He's going to be that way until we've got the victory everywhere. Death is gone. Where's your sting? It doesn't. 21, and in his name shall the nations trust. 
Then was brought unto him one possessed with the devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him insomuch that the blind and the dumb both spake and saw. In other words, he documented his powers, the fact that God's love was in him. Because do you know what? That'll be taken wrong by the Pharisees. But that's an act of love. God saw this person that the devil just had bound up. And God said, you get your hands off my property now. And he released that boy. And he both was, had sight and he could speak because God loved him. God created that child. And that faith brought that child where you are used today to take truth so that people can see that are spiritually blind as to what's happening in this world. And you can give them that breath of fresh air that God loves them, that God's in control. Well, now, does that mean we're never going to have any trouble anymore? Oh, we're going to have lots of trouble. Bring it on. We can handle it, okay? Don't, don't let a little thing get you down because Brahma, God has promised you something else. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. I will never allow you to be tempted over what you can handle. I know you can cut it. And I will always show you a way out. Always. Not maybe, not perhaps. I will always. You stick with me. And I will show you a way out. There was a, again, while we're, while we're here, 17. Let's go to Matthew 17. One other thing that really pleased God is, was this son and those that followed him. And for this congregation, I can say, understand when they follow him, we're talking about those chosen before the foundation of the world that are already following him. I chose you before the foundations, God's election, okay? Part of the family. Uh, chapter 17, and after, verse 1, and after six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his brother, and bringeth them up into a high mountain apart, and was transfigured before them, and his face did shine as the sun, and his raiment was white as the light. Now, do you know what's happening here? He's teaching them what's about to happen. That they're going to crucify him, but he's going to raise from the dead. He's going to be transfigured. This is so these three would know that. God always lets his people know in advance. Okay, that's what's happening. Verse 3, And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elias talking with him. Moses is the law, and Elijah is the head prophet. Okay? Both the prophet and the law right there with them. It's raised. It's resurrected. It's coming to pass. Then answered Peter and said unto Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If thou wilt, let us make uh, here three tabernacles, one for thee and one for Moses and one for Elias. In other words, they probably thought, man, the kingdom is here. We got it made. It's all over. We're going to slide right into it. Let's make a tabernacles right here. Um, but Jesus had already told them, I'm, I'm going to be gone. So you got to keep up, all right? You got to believe what he says, okay? Uh, verse 5 While he yet spake, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and behold, a voice out of the cloud which said, This is my beloved Son. In him I am well pleased. Hear ye him. You listen to him. That's our Heavenly Father. It pleases him to have used the Son, Emmanuel, God with us. Love him. He's the living word. He will never steer you wrong. When you follow him, you are pleasing to God and the blessings will flow. When the disciples heard it, they f fell on their face and were so afraid. And then he went ahead and told them, don't share this with anyone until I'm resurrected. And then you can tell them we came here 
and you saw me transfigured way before the fact so that there were no surprises to anyone God, as it is written in Mark 13 concerning the end times, he swears there to you. I have foretold you all things. And I guess the question would be, as he asked many people, haven't you read? And that's why we have to stick with the word. And that's why we have to get in that word, is to know what it is that pleases him if you expect to be blessed by him. And do you know what? Would you believe, as busy as he is, in the fact that he created all things and keeps up with all things, that it pleases him to bless you? Do you know where we can document that? Go with me to Luke 12. In closing, Luke chapter 12. This is one of my favorite chapters in the Bible because it it talks to the um, worry warts. And, and, um, and hey, so I, I really believe that some people were born to worry. Right? I really, I mean, there's nothing you can do about it. And I won't say why I believe that, but there, I mean, you can just encourage and encourage, and they're gonna find something to worry about, okay? And that kind of, that, that uh, make, causes you to doubt God in a way when you do that, okay? Luke chapter 12, let's pick it up with verse, uh, well, let's talk about this just a minute. God is reasoning with this person. He said, hey, he said, worrying won't add one moment to your life. Look at the lilies. Do you think they worry? And look how beautiful they are. And you're worried about clothes? I mean, I, I take care of their clothes and beauty, and they sure don't worry about it. And he continues on then, and, and he says, let's pick it up with verse 29. And seek not ye what you shall eat, or what you shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind, don't worry. 30, for all these things do the nations of the world seek after, and your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. He knows you need them, and he loves you. He's going to see that things fall your way where you can take care of business. Now listen further, 31. But rather, on the other hand, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God. Well, what is the kingdom? It means the king who is Jesus Christ and his dominion which is everywhere, okay? Seek it. Know that you're protected everywhere. And all these things shall be added unto you. Now you got, that's a promise. If you will seek the kingdom, he owns the rest, he knows you need it, and he will add it unto you. Now here's the verse we came here for and in closing, 32. Fear not, get it out of your head. Fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It pleases him. It delights him. It is his pleasure to give you that kingdom. So what are you worried about? Well, maybe I should worry I'm not going to do it right. Well, he's got repentance for you. How many backups do you need? You know, don't worry. It is a waste of time. Rather, translate that into a can-do type person with God's blessings and light shining upon you and you being successful by taking the right road whereby you know that God is with you. It, do you know something? When you give him pleasure, he's going to give you pleasure. He knows personally, and not he alone, but even the angels in heaven, when a sinner repents and comes back into the family, they rejoice. Makes them happy. You do that. It isn't God's will that anybody suffer or that anybody be cast aside 
from loving him and serving him. Now, again, some of us folks got to realize there's some tough roads out there, and that doesn't bother you, does it? It don't bother you to go down a tough road because we're going to come out the other side. We may even change and give some attitude adjustments while we're going through, okay? We're going to make it. We're can-do type people. So don't let the little things, you know, you know one of the things it says in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13 that you hear me quote so often? It said, anything that happens to you is common. It happens to everybody. And everybody has to handle it. So do it, okay? And he'll always show you a way through. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Father, for the privilege of serving you. We thank you, Father, for being allowed to serve you. Father, use these ones, Father. Father, trim their lights. Brighten them, Father. We ask that they be obvious and shining to all they come in contact with, that they are a pleasure and give you pleasure, Father. In his precious name, Yeshua, we ask it. Amen, amen. Free introductory package. Say, this is something we would like to offer for a one-time gift to all the new folk that study with us. This introductory package gives you a monthly newsletter, which means each month you will receive a newsletter with a Bible study on it. Hey, raising funds? No way. We're not beggars. We're Bible teachers. That's what it consists of. A tape catalog that will give you all the topics that are covered. And the Mark of the Beast tape. What is this Mark of the Beast? Is it really on your forehead? No, Satan's considerably more intelligent than that. It's in your forehead, which is to say in your mind. Have you been deceived? This is a free offer to you. One time to each new student. Say, find out what's really happening and what the story is on the Mark of the Beast. Um, Luke, the writer of the gospel, was a medical doctor. God approves of medical doctors. God approves of um, anyone that sticks to his health laws and teaches a better way of living, a healthier way of living. But because of the pollution in this world and everything, we have things like Graves' disease, but it is pollution of man, basically, that brings many of these things on, not our Father's doings, okay? And um, if, uh, if some person tells you that to continue taking medication is showing a lack of faith, don't believe it. And especially if you have been on a medication and you think about leaving it, at least ask your doctor about it. I know, I'm, I know that may offend some of you. I could care less. You heard in the last lecture where a preacher told a man with chronic heart failure to stop taking his medicine, and guess what? He told him he was healed, stop taking it, and he died at 39. That made the preacher a murderer. You know, uh, faith uh, is, is um, knowledge. It, faith is taking advantage of all the knowledge and the help that God can give you. There are many Christian doctors that pray, but um, many of, uh, anyway, it's foolish when you have a condition that can give you much problems don't ever let some here tick. And I, I'm sure I've got some people really revolving right now, and that's fine. If God wants to heal you, he will totally heal you whereby the medication would override and the doctor would take you off of it anyway. At the next time he gave you a blood test, and I'm sure with what you're taking, you probably have a blood test at least every six months. Do not stop taking your medication. Uh, Colleen from Arkansas, what is the difference between an evil spirit and a familiar spirit? Well, sometimes a familiar spirit can be uh, a, um, a recommender, um, 
pretend to be something that it's not, but it's still, it's an evil spirit, okay? They're, but you can't go wrong saying they're the same thing, okay? Uh, because it is, it is even evil to pretend to represent a loved one speaking from the grave. That's so corny, so Satanish, so devilish. If God wants one of your loved ones that has passed on to speak to you, he knows how to take care of business. It won't be through some um, a ventriloquist. Jake from Nevada, why do you teach we must forgive others without their repentance when Luke 17, 3 says otherwise? Well, I still go with Luke 17, 3. Have you never told, heard me say, if a brother offends you, go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, pick it up with verse 6, and it tells you there to, if a brother does not align, then separate yourself from him, and do not treat him as an enemy, but correct him as a brother. That might even mean having nothing to do with him. But if you let it build up in your system, this is where you're confusing what I'm saying. If you let it build up in your system and never get it out and never let it go, it'll destroy you. So naturally it's better that you take Christ's tack and forgive them for they know not what they do. You don't have to go to them and stand before them. I'm out of time. Hey, I love you all a bunch. Why? Because you enjoy studying our Father's Word in more depth. Most important, God loves you for it. You know what? It makes His day when you study His letter and gain that knowledge that He would have you retrieve for your mind, okay? We are brought to you by your tithes and offerings. If we've helped you, help us keep coming to you. Bless God, he will always bless you. Most important this, stay in his word. Every day in his word is a good day. You know why? Jesus, Yeshua, he is the living word. Hearing God's word with understanding will change your life. We hope you have enjoyed studying God's word here on the Shepherd's Chapel Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. If you would like to receive more information concerning Shepherd's Chapel, you may request our free introductory offer. Our introductory offer contains the Mark of the Beast audio tape, our monthly newsletter with a written Bible study, a tape catalog, and a list of written reference works available through Shepherd's Chapel. To request our free introductory offer by telephone, call 800-643-4645, 24 hours a day. You may also request our introductory offer by writing to Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas, 72736. Once again, that's Shepherd's Chapel, Post Office Box 416, Gravit, Arkansas. 72736. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program and God bless you.